So, uh, hey everybody, welcome to Chewstream. We are very honored always to welcome such talented artists and guests guest starring on the stream and today is no different because i have my buddy john hardesty on the stream what's up everybody <laughs> right on and uh john is um kind enough to do a wonderful painting demonstration that i'm excited to see so this is going to be really great um and of course we have my wonderful sidekick Ms. seki on this on the stream as well hey guys Right on, and uh, so is this, I just wanted to start off by just asking where this picture is from. Is this your own dog, John, or? This is, yeah, this is from my kitchen, and uh, and the lighting, I came out in the morning and I was like, whoa, you know, like like on my back porch, it's, um, you know, I can see east, like my, my studio is facing north, like the window's facing north, but over top of my studio, you know, when I look out my back window is east. And so the sun kind of streams in. So this was in the morning, and I think I was the only one up. And I grabbed my phone. I was like, "Whoa, that lighting is really cool. It was crazy." And so, uh, so I had to had to snap a quick picture, and then, um, and then I actually saw someone do uh, on Instagram. I saw a piece of art. Um, it was uh, Aaron Aaron Griffin, I think, is who did it. And he did this sort of like sun, you know, this this painting with uh, this demo with the uh, real strong sunlight like that in in a in one area, and then kind of cools off to the side and. And I saw him do that, and I was like, oh, I remember that picture I had. I was like, I want to do that. So, um, so I, that's what that's where it came from. Yeah, this is Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the the really cool thing about what you just said was, um, and something that I wanted to kind of touch on a little bit. You know, a lot of people we use media, social media, for different reasons, right? And some people use it more in a way of like entertainment, mm -hmm. uh, where you're just constantly looking through oh, I look through all these drawings every day, all these paintings every day, yet the person does nothing with it. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of similarities to so many of the people that I've um, you know, seen on the streams, talked with in person, stuff like that, uh, they don't do it. You know, they don't use social media that way. They use it to gobble up information. And yeah. then, like yourself translating it into your own stuff into something that interests you that talks about your life and all that and uh, applies this new knowledge in a different way to totally absorb it yeah absolutely it's you know for me like and, and some people say like you post a lot of other artists on your stream and uh, some people are i mean on your uh, on your feed on on instagram and uh, i'm like yeah i'm like because that's what's going through my head you know the, and and you know i for me, it's awesome. Like, like the digital era is great for that because, you know, I mean, if you wanted to see someone work or wanted to see a real good reproduction of someone's work a long time ago, 100 years ago, I mean, you just had to go and stand next to them. You had to travel a long way, go and stand next to them. And now we get people's thoughts. And, and I mean, it's like a step-by-step -step process. Like, that's what the guy posted, a step-by-step, -step, like a, a, a thing like that. And it was, it was awesome. So, I mean, for me, like, that's inspiring. Like, I, I see other people kicking butt and... You know, um, you know, and it's like you have that moment where you're like, dang, that is good. You're like, man. And you have that like that jealous moment where you're like, that is so dang good. And then you're like, oh, I, I got to try that. You know, I got to I got to learn and do that, you know, and I love that because it's like going to the museum. You know, it's for me, it's like going to the museum and seeing people just kick butt and, and it just inspires you, you know, mm -hmm. I think love it. What I like about your Instagram when you post all these uh, different artists is that I get to see what your like what inspires you, and then it kind of gives me a it like broadens my library of artists. Like totally, yeah, for myself. So I think it's really cool that you do that. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, oh, oh go sorry. ahead, Bobby. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. And actually, um, why don't we mention John's uh, Instagram right now since we're talking about it? What, oh. What's your uh, What's your handle on Instagram again? It's just John Hardesty, but it's J O N, J O N okay. Hardesty. Yeah, J O N H A R D E S T Y. Right on. Yeah. Um, but as well, like I feel the same way. I feel the same way as Masse. Like I really like seeing all the wonderful uh, paintings and stuff like this from uh, artists from the past. Uh, I remember a Dean Cornwell vignette that you put up uh, recently. I guess like last week or something. It's really mm -hmm. really cool. Yeah, um, 
But I'd have to say at the same time, I would love to see more of your art. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I know, Absolutely. I know, like, lots of people think about that. Um, I know, like, when I start posting too much of one kind of topic, like, say, it's photos from a trip that I'm, you know, on <laughs> yeah. and things like that, then yeah. people start to go, well, where's the art, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, or true. the worst, the worst pet peeve that, mo- you know, I'm sure I share this with a lot of people. It's when... Uh, you know, somebody has a child, and it's wonderful <laughs> to see the child the the I one know. time, you I know, know or the five times or whatever. <laughs> but all of a sudden, their Instagram or their Facebook just becomes this child. Like, I didn't follow this child, man. I followed this artist. You know what I mean? Like, that's, do you think about... <laughs> do you think about, like... um kind of like the mix the cocktail of posts that you're posting up or do you just kind of just go with uh, oh this is cool i'm gonna post this this is cool i'm gonna post that yeah i mean i try i try to think about it you know the 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 downside for me is that like so like i I have a bunch of paintings in process right now but the problem is when they're sunken in if i take a picture of it it kind of looks crappy you know Mm -hmm. and so there's only key moments when i can sort of oil out and get it to look the way it needs to look, you know, and because I don't want to post up something and people be like, that looks like garbage, you know, Um, so it has to be at a real key, uh, uh, at like key moments, you know, where I can get it like, and I need to, and also the other thing too is that, you know, when I'm painting, there's not a lot of reflection on it because I can move around and I can set it up in the right way, but when you go to take a picture, Oh, it gets yeah, tricky. Yeah. It gets tricky. So, so tricky. Yeah. So I, I, what I, I actually was thinking, and I think I need to like take a section of my studio and kind of rope it off and set up like put some markers on the ground and set up the lights exactly mm-hmm. where they're going to be, so that I can just wheel my easel over there, take a photo, and then you know uh, wheel it back to paint wherever I'm going to paint. You know, and and I think that would be the best way to do it. I was actually just thinking that, and I have these. I have these like kind of grip light things and I have them up and I was, I was actually just going to do that. So I think I'll get, cause you have to have them at a certain point, like to really, so it doesn't, so you can see the texture of the paint, but not, you know, not have a crazy glare. It's, it's a little bit tricky photographing oil paints, uh, you know, oil painting. So that's, that's the main thing. But when I have digital stuff, it's like, you know, maybe I should do like more smaller digital studies and, and uh, those are easy to post up, you know? Um, so. Yeah, I guess uh, a lot of times i because I don't work in oil, even though I, the more and more I, I want to start trying it, you know, but um, it's just time and everything. Sure, sure. ultimate enemy. So oh, yeah, time. that would be like, I know, because you've got, because you've got, you know, commitments, you know, job commitments, you know, and, and work commitments. And so, you you know, to do those in oils, you'd be like, well, can you just wait a week on that? Well, then. <laughs> <laughs> that's like you know, <laughs> you know no can't do that you know so you know i understand yeah and that's so it would basically be something that you would have to do as like an enrichment thing like outside of that which you know these days is, is tough for you <laughs> yeah oh my gosh it's tough uh still working on how to schedule in uh you know less things that i don't want to do and schedule in more things right. i do want to do that's always a that's always a challenge man it's always tricky mm-hmm. by the way by the way if you have kids ever you will do the same thing your feed will be totally blown up with them <laughs> i heard it's the same for cats and dogs as well <laughs> yes that's right. that's right and everyone will be like Okay, like, you know, you're like, look, my baby, it's it squeaked and it it moved its hand, and you'll be like, this is amazing, you know. <laughs> yeah, if I ever start doing that, just block me, John. <laughs> just block me. I'm not gonna block you, dude. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like, oh yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> it was a phase. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But I'm, you know, I've I've got two kids, you know, and and what it starts to wane the more children you have, like. The people I know that have like six or eight kids by the eighth kid, it's like where's like they have no pictures of their kids because it's just like, <laughs> oh yeah, it's that one. What's his name again? I don't know. You know, it's that one. Yeah, just, just you know, they, they have so many that they can't. They lose that that uh, side of things. <laughs> oh, totally. I I don't even know how people can handle two kids, let alone eight kids. My goodness. Um, yeah, but well, then again, 
I have no experience with that, so that's probably <laughs> why I don't understand. Yeah. Um, well, let's go on to some questions here. So, and for those of you in the chat, big shouts out to everybody in the chat. A whole bunch of familiar friends there. Oh, yeah, um, hey, Dustin Clark's here. He's in my class right now. He's kicking butt. Right on, Mr. Dustin Clark. Um, that's fantastic. You know, I always love seeing or knowing that teachers are continuously learning. You know, that it's like that's the best kind of teaching you could do is to kind of like be the role model. Absolutely. Um, so big shouts out to Mr. Clark. And uh, first question is, when doing concepts, do you, do you all start with line or just doing shapes with a thick brush? Okay. So, um, and we'll, we'll totally delve into what we were talking about just before the stream as well, since he's talking about concepts. Um, so I guess I'll start. Uh, after a while, I, I feel like drawing feels more and more like painting, and painting feels more and more like drawing, and the, the lines really start to blur. So uh, I kind of start with a bit of both. You know, I'll get a brush generally. I... I you know, work in many different ways, but generally I'll get a brush that has uh, a good variety of shape dynamics so that I can draw and paint at the same time. Um, yeah, so that was, that's pretty much what I wanted to say about that. Um, anybody else want to chime in? Do you start with lines or do you start with uh, doing shapes with uh, thick brushes? I do. I do both, man. Like, I, you know, for me, I, I agree with you 100%. It really starts to gel. You know, like, once you start, and, and that's kind of what I'm, what I'm trying to get my students to, they're, they're going through the value stage now, and, and Masay knows about that. She hears me harping on that. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it, <laughs> but it's, you know, getting people to see things. I think naturally, like when we're kids, we, we think of things in terms of symbols. Like, we think of the eye as a symbol, you know, and we draw it like that almond shape, and we, you know, and we, we think in terms of line, like a lot of times, I think naturally we sort of, you know, gravitate towards the contour, you know, and, and outlining because that's where the distinction is for things. And, and even when we don't see an edge, you know, like if you look on the, the shadow side of the dog there, you know, like um, on, on the neck on the shadow side right below that where the bed is, it's pretty much a lost edge in the floor. You know, you can see it like if mm -hmm. you even just squint your eyes slightly, I mean, it just bleeds right into there, yeah. you know, and so... Um, you know, it, 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 areas like that, we tend to put a line there because we're like, well, I know the bed ends there, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a line there, and 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 I even I did that right there, you know. But see, when I go to put in the values, I won't do that. But, um, but you know, we tend to think that way. So getting, getting people to think about it, in terms of masses of value, and and that's getting that to be your focus is is really key, I think. And and so. You know, I, I agree with you. It starts to gel. Like once you start to really understand how to draw and what it takes to make something look right, you understand it's the masses of, of light and dark and, and things like that. So it's so the lines become less important, you know, and they're just kind of markers for you, you know, and they just kind of serve to help you help guide you on your way, you know. And uh, to put a little bit of context, um, you know, you're saying that Masse knows what you're talking about, and so that's because Masse is taking your uh, class right now, uh, essentials of or essentials of realism with uh, John Hardesty uh, fantastic class very you know for me it's it's a very refreshing and unique look on how to paint because um, like for example this very start you know I'm looking at it and I'm like for me that would be a mistake and then I would want to start all over just because <laughs> you know um, I think heavily in structure, right? Mm -hmm. And so linear structure, like getting the structure tight is kind of really important for me. Right. And of course that's important for you as well, but you, sure. you know what I mean, right? Like right no, now. No, totally, totally. Right now, what are you concentrating on more? Are you concentrating on the structure more? Are you concentrating on the lighting more, the colors? You know, probably a combination of a bunch of things, but. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I tend to, like, I tend to shift between things, but definitely, like, I know what you mean, like, 
you know, I'm not I'm not looking for perspective lines in the eyes and in the face and you know, like thinking I'm not thinking about the skull under the dog's, you know, skin and things. I'm not thinking about anything like that, you know. Right um, now you're not thinking right about now, it. Right now, yeah. right. What I'm doing what I'm doing here is really reacting completely to the light. So, you know, and, and I always say this to my students, I always say, look, if you take something, you know, and, and you bring it to a closet and you turn off all the lights, I'm like, what do you see? And they're like, nothing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, and, and, and they're like, okay, that's stupid job. But, but, you know, but that's really the point. The point is, you know, what makes something look realistic is the light on it. And, and a very, to make something look how it looks in a particular lighting, you have to capture what the light is doing. Now, I know this sounds funny, but it's, but a lot of times people will, uh, be trying to retain the fidelity of what they see uh, when they're painting or drawing, and they're not considering the light first. You know, they're considering you know the structure first or something like that, which is which is awesome. Like it's 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 not that I am against that approach or whatever. It's just a different way of approaching things. You know, and and so when you can can combine the two, it actually works really really well. But but the way Sargent and Zorn and people like that could get these really loose paintings to still look completely realistic. I mean, when you step back from one of those paintings in a museum. They look like they're going to step out of the canvas. You walk up to it, and it's like two strokes. And everyone's like, how did they do that? I don't understand how they did that. They did that by really breaking it down to the lights and the darks and capturing the shapes of the lights and the darks. And then that in this, that includes color as well. Um, so really, I'm focusing on the shapes of light and dark. And they're, they're out of whack right now, right? So, you know, the face, you can see, like, the face is, is similar, but it's, like, it's not the right proportion, and it's a little bit wide and... and you know, but what I'm going for now is I'm, I'm basically working from general to specific, but I'm almost imagining this uh, abstractly as I'm looking at this, right? So I'm squinting mm -hmm. down and imagining all these shapes of light and dark abstractly, and I'm getting them all value-wise and color-wise to work with each other. And, and once that happens, then, you know, it's very easy for me to make a correction to the proportion on the dog's head by just placing a stroke next to that light area or placing, you know, like, like kind of carving in and things like that. So... I'm, I'm, I was a little bit free with the, with the drawing, like leaving some errors because I knew, you know, I if I if I had students that were watching me, I'd be a little bit more, you know, if this was like a demo for them, I'd, I'd be a little bit more, you know, strict with each stage, you know, for their sake. But I know I can get it back, and so uh, I was a little more free with it here. But hopefully that makes sense. That makes perfect sense, and uh, it, it especially makes sense with your line drawing. You know, I I watched, I I haven't actually watched every single lesson of your class but the ones that I have watched you know obviously you start off in the very beginning of your class just dealing with straight lines right very yeah. simplified uh, geometry of whatever it is that your subject matter is and then I see those influences in your drawing in your initial drawing but say like the the hip area of the dog you just went for it you just did a curve line and mm -hmm. that you know obviously if this was part of your lesson one then you would construct that curve into a bunch of uh, straight lines right yeah because that's you know um i when I, I what i always tell students is when you're dealing with a curve always imagine it like it's a bunch of straight lines and the reason i tell them that is so they don't exaggerate it uh it's very very easy when people are trying to capture what they're seeing when there's a curve or a slight divot somewhere or something like that they everybody exaggerates it you know and and um, it's really easy to do that, and and so I usually, because uh, I'm thinking about that curve like it's a, a series of of straight angles, you know, and uh, that's the way I'm thinking about it in my head, even though I'm doing a curve, and that helps me keep from over overdoing the curve and, and making it exaggerated. Because oftentimes when people, are especially doing this method, or when when they're doing it, they they have it's not. Once people get a little bit proficient with it, it's not that they're making these huge errors. It's 30 tiny little errors and 30 little exaggerations that lead to it not looking quite right, you know? So if you can break it down to that simple structure and kind of imagine it that way, it helps you keep a handle on things. So that's, you know, but, what, you know, again, I'm taking shortcuts. You know, once once you feel real comfortable with it, you know, and, and you can you can roll with it much, much more clear and you have more confidence in your ability to, to get it right by the end, you know? I can, uh, I, you know, I, I just kind of, uh, you know, improvise a lot. And, and also, that's what gives me more interesting brush strokes when I'm working with it, either digitally or, you know, working with oil paint. When I have that sort of, like, exploratory way of going about things, you know, it, it leads to some interesting brush strokes. And I know I can get it back 
you know, um, so if I need to, so it lets me like let some uh, some accidents happen that actually look cool. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to just talk about something that you you repeated a couple times, which is to bring it back. You know, you're you're putting in all this loose stuff, but you know that you can bring it back. And yeah. uh, of course, what that means is to bring it back to a tight form again, you know, right. um, and thinking on all these other different levels and kind of yeah. bringing it to finish. Now, how does, how do you bring it back? Is well, there something that people can do or people can uh, exercise or try, you know, to, to learn how to strengthen that part of their brain? Sure. Yeah. Well, it kind of, it, it breaks down, and this is really what my class is about. It breaks down to the four key areas that you have to kind of consider: um, proportion, value, edge, and color. So I'm always thinking about those things. So when it comes to proportion, there's all these different tools to triangulate. Like you're looking at these shapes of light and dark, and you're trying to triangulate and try to figure out, like, okay, where is this, you know, sitting in the mix, and, and how does this relate to the other shapes of light and dark, and and where, you know, and so that's the proportion side. The the value side is how dark or how light something is. And so you're comparing back and forth and you're getting a feel for, you know, the value range of the object that you're drawing and then the value range that you're using on your painting and you're trying to make that fit. And then there's also, you know, color, how one warm relates to another cool or, you know, how cool is something compared to this? How warm is something compared to this? How much am I manipulating the color? You know, color is pretty, you can get away with a lot, but, but edge, you know, is also something that I'm not considering. I'm considering a little bit at this point, but not too much, you know, but it's, it's, how hard or soft an edge is, how long a transition is, how, you know, um, if you look at, you know, uh, you know, the, the shift in, there's a, there's a shift in value on the background, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a, on the darker part of the background, you can see it's like a very slight shift, like near that lighter part in the bottom right of the, of the wall in the back, you can see it, it actually shifts, but then when that edge of that light spot on the back right on the wall is actually very hard, so mm -hmm. there's edges and there's softer edges, and so, you know, keeping keeping track of all that. So it's it's a number of different things, and they're all foundational things. Um, and so you have to kind of work down your checklist. Okay, how am I doing in terms of proportion? How am I doing in terms of values? How am I doing in terms of edges? How am I doing in terms of color? And and you're going through that checklist. At first, it's like really laborious. It's like, you know, it feels like, oh my gosh, I've got to go through, and this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And it feels really kind of, you know, frustrating and slow. But the more comfortable you get with that and the more accurate your decisions, the, the more quickly you can move. And when I'll tell you what, when you can really do this, you know, uh, properly, man, you can you can move quick. I mean, you can move really quick and get something down. You know, it's kind of well, we were talking about that one time with that Nathan Falk painting where he did that. You know, what was it like? Like eight strokes for that duck or whatever. Yeah, it was, it's incredible. It's a five minute painting of a duck yeah. that just looks insanely cool. And that's what he he's like there's no way he's thinking about the structure there he's he's you know like in that type of a situation he may be thinking about it but but really the way he's painting is closer to this like like really capturing the shapes of light and dark in it and it's almost like an abstract painting you know mm -hmm. and just and just and we we can interpret it as that because the the shapes of light and dark are correct you know and and the edges are correct and and all that so um, so that's very similar to kind of what I'd be doing here, you know, and and, and so that's what I'm saying. When, when you get really, really good and very, very accurate with it, you can move super fast, you know, super fast. Well, you know, um, the really cool thing about this is that I also have another computer open where I can see uh, everything in live stream. So I'm seeing this image in a small version and uh, even though in the big version, it looks more like a bunch of patches of different kinds of color and stuff and very loose, when you look at it from far away, you actually, you see the dog. Right, right. You start to see it. You start to get a sense of it. Yeah. And see, and see, that's, that's always the thing that's really interesting to me. And I think that's why I'm drawn to this, this way of approaching things. Like I, I always, I remember going to the museum and just seeing, like walking up to a Zorn and, and being like, that looks like nothing. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it looks like, what is that? You know, and then you back up and it's like, and I remember, you know, being young as in, in terms of art years, you know, being a young artist and, and thinking like, man, how the heck did he do that? You know, how did he do that? Like, how did he get that to, to read so well with so little, you know, and, and that, that's always, that is always the thing that impresses me when someone, 
whether it's a writer, whether it's a, you know, no matter what it is, when they can simplify mm -hmm. to a huge degree and still be powerful. Like, I, I love Jeff Jones. I think he's a great artist for that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Frazetta was like that, too, you know, and, and it's just accomplishing so much with so little, you know, and that, that's always interesting to me. Like, that, that, that's always kind of, you know, uh, it really driven me as an artist to, to try to get that simplification uh, down and, and do it in a good way, you know. I just think it resonates. Um, yeah, by the way, somebody asked, uh, what was I eating earlier? I'm sorry, I was so into, like, the conversation, <laughs> and I saw this piece of chocolate. I was like, yeah, eat this piece of chocolate while listening to John's, you know, answer. Dude, you go for it, man. You it eat was that just chocolate. a natural kind of thing. Um, I'm sorry, I won't do that Dude, again. If you have, a, if you have a, uh, the, look. Yeah, I'm just going to say this for everybody. Everybody across the board, if you have an opportunity to eat a piece of chocolate, just do it because you don't know when you might die. Just eat the chocolate, okay? <laughs> Regardless. Yeah, these are these are all my wonderful days of when I can still eat chocolate, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to think about it like that. So uh, let's go on to the next question. The next question says, I would love to attend the London workshop for Sunday, but... My schedule was unsure until now, and I missed the discount code. Is there any way or any chance to get a discount for London now? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, you know, once you miss the discount code, it's pretty much done. It's all automatic. Um, but what I can tell you is that the London workshop is going to sell out. We have less than 30 tickets left, and by the time this airs on YouTube, who knows it might just be sold out by that time so um opportunities don't last forever what i would recommend is just take the you know bite the bullet and do it because um you know don't let 20 30 pounds or dollars or whatever uh stop you from a great experience that might just benefit your life a whole lot your career a whole lot but uh hey what do i know Ask other people that have gone, and I'm sure they would say the same thing. Um, let's go on to another question. So, next question says, uh, okay, so I guess this one's for me. Hey, Bobby, I started meditating, and I know you do too, but my mind always wanders off. I can't concentrate. Any tips? Yeah. <laughs> That's how meditation is, you know. It's just like I remember <laughs> yesterday... I was meditating in the morning and uh, and my mind just would not shut up. And it wasn't even saying full on sentences. It was just saying like two strung, you know, words strung together. Like, uh, how about that? Or something like that. It's like something really short, you know, it's just like, <laughs> where are all these words coming from? Where are all these thoughts coming from? But um there's many different types of meditation. What I generally do is I try to kind of back away, so to speak, from what I'm seeing and hearing and kind of hear my own thoughts, see my own kind of uh, imagery or whatever it is I'm picturing more as an observer as opposed to being in the scene talking or in the scene, actually listening to whatever thoughts, you know, try to take a big step back and try to just observe and let it dissipate. Um, and of course, I'm an artist. I'm not a Buddhist monk that meditates, you know, as a living and stuff like that. But that's what works for me. And uh, hopefully that will work for you. Do you guys meditate? No, not really. Mm, yeah, I'd, like to, I'd like to get into it. Oh, okay. Right on. John? Yeah, we talked. We talked about that. I, I don't do it, you know. Um, but you had mentioned. Um, I got. I got to look that guy up too. That you mentioned that, and also um, Wim Hof. Wim Hof. Yes, yeah. yes, that guy. I got to look that guy. That that sounds crazy, man. Uh, you know, Alistair Alistair Overeem. Yes. The, the fighter. He does that. I, That's I, I right. That. And yeah. he won. <laughs> you know, dude, he's he's hardcore, man. So ever since, well. There's only been one fight since he said he started training, you know, with the Wim Hof method. But yeah. um, he won that fight. So it must yeah. be Wim Hof. <laughs> That's know. right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> he won it decisively, too. <laughs> yeah. It's really cool. Like, um, I'm 
there's 10 weeks in total, but you kind of go on your own pace. And I feel like I've been on week four for about three weeks now. Mm-hmm. But uh, I feel like I'm pretty darn sure now that I'm I'm starting to be able to um, control my blood vessels a little bit, you know, by changing the circulation in my body from like... And I'm, who knows? Maybe it's just all in my mind and stuff. <laughs> but this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to try to train your mind so that you can control your blood circulation and you try to kind of close off or tighten up a lot of the blood circulation that goes into your limbs so that you can withstand the cold a lot better, right? You keep all the Mm -hmm. circulation within, you keep all the warmth within. Anyways, we're totally getting off track. That's pretty crazy. (laughs) I like it though, it's fun. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So next thing here, oh, and Kendra, I'd like to give you a suggestion, okay? There's this app called uh, Headspace. Get it, get the free version, do the 10 day, uh, 10 minute uh, meditations, guided meditations. I think that's a great way to get into meditation if you, you know, want to. And it's all free. Um, You can subscribe, but the app is free. Anyways, okay, so let's go on to the next question. Sorry, dragging that on too long. KG, KJP asks, uh, hi, Bobby, did, how did you... How did you build your sketch group in Toronto? I'm trying to do this, the same thing in Paris with a friend, a friend I met on your stream, and I want to reach as many people as possible. Well, um, I, number one thing is stay consistent. Actually, number one thing you already got, which is get a buddy, because when nobody comes in the very beginning, uh, it's a lot easier to keep going when you got a buddy. And something for you to know uh, is that, you know, I I went consistently, I post on forums, I posted everywhere um, consistently for a year. And it wasn't until after the year did the group started to really become stable and start to flourish. So, you know, good things take time. Got to keep going and just keep plugging away. Uh, This next question is for John. This is from one of your students, which is also a wonderful teacher named uh, Dustin Clark. Mr. Clark asks, uh, for Jonathan, any advice for my high school art students? Oh, that's a good one. Um, Yeah, it's, it's, I think a lot of high school art students, like it, it, um, uh, they get a lot of confusing information thrown at them, you know, and and um, a lot of high school students like, like I think the, the the university approach kind of trickles down and 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 makes it into high school, but it's like a weird version of it, and you know it's fine if people want to go that route, but oftentimes I find students that uh, that are younger they want to learn to draw and paint, right? They want to they want to like they want to do it accurately they, and they want to do it you know uh they want something to look realistic you know and and they get this confusing information probably not from dustin but you know but they get confusing information you know uh like well you just have to feel your way through it and, and it's kind of this murky you know this murky uh thing you know where they're like i don't really know what it means to be an artist and i you know I, I i've talked to a lot of students and they really feel like that they feel like i don't, I don't know what it takes and it's just weird you know you either you have to be a weird person you have to have like weird ideas and tape toilet seats to the, the, you know, the ceiling or, you know, and make that an installation or, you know, I mean, they, they don't know, really know what it takes. And I would say, you know, a lot of times to high school students, I think the thing they need to hear is, is treat it like a craft, you know, treat it like a craft and, and treat it serious, you know, and, and, you know, you have friends that take, you know, music lessons, you have friends that play sports and they're practicing all the time, do that and break it down, break down the technique, you know, figure out what needs to, what you need to grow in. Uh, to, on a technical level, and once you get that technical level under, you know, once you get that technical side under wraps, once you once you understand that a lot more, that's going to free you up to express yourself. But you won't hear a lot of people talking about that, and and you also won't see a lot of people encouraging high school students to really approach it like a craft. You know, if they're doing science or math or you know physics or you know, I mean, if they're doing something like that, people are like, okay, you know, they they understand the the craft side of it the the technical side of it but but they don't really talk about that a lot with art and so 
I think you know a lot of kids naturally just want to do it well, and and but they don't you know either have the tools or they feel like you know it, it, I don't know. Do you, I mean, did you guys feel like that in high school? I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely felt like that. I mean, when I was confronted with art, I didn't I didn't make art in high school, but I felt like it was just like this weird thing like that didn't really make sense you know <laughs> i definitely felt like that in high school and in college i i f- kind of feel like uh a good part of it is like uh maybe they don't feel that we have that much uh of an attention span when we're younger mm-hmm. and, or you know in the very beginning it's like it's like your class i was i was uh asking Massey oh, so how's John's class going? This is in the second week. And she was like, oh, yeah, it's going really well. I like it. I love it, you know, and this and that. And then I was like, oh, well, wh- where's the uh, homework? What- I would love to see it. And she's like, well, there's no real point in putting up the homework right now because they're exercises, right? And and right. I feel like this kind of relates to how things go in high school and college. It's so much based on, like, you got to produce this painting of this dog, yes. right? You got to already like be at that level because everything else, uh, parents, everybody, they won't understand it. Even though right. that is what you should be doing, that is what you should be concentrating on: is building the tools so that you can, you know, create something awesome and amazing. And I would absolutely love to hear Massey's uh, thoughts on this because. Masay, you're obviously you're the youngest in the three, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah. people talking here, and of course you remember high school much better than we do, mm-hmm. you know. So, um, any advice for Mr. Clark's high school uh, art students? Um, totally ooh. putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, high school. I didn't really think of art that much but now that I think about it I do wish that um, the teacher did kind of enforce the whole um, basics on me but um, like what you said it's like a sport it's like a like doing math or doing science you kind of have to know the basics in order to get to like the final product Uh, (laughs) it's hard to explain for me but um uh, I don't know. It's... Now that makes total <laughs> sense. That makes total sense. I think, you know, like deep down inside, I just feel like uh, perhaps school or whatever might feel like a lot of people won't have that kind of concentration mm-hmm. um, to be able to make it effective, even though that is the best thing to do. That is uh, the best way to get extremely good is to concentrate on the fundamentals and f- all the really hardcore artists out there, I'm talking about the high school students as well, uh, they are totally into it and they can totally concentrate that heavy on something that other people might find less interesting. Right. right? Yeah, totally. I, it's yeah. almost like we're slowing everything down so that the other people that might not care about art as much or might not have that much interest or, you know, expect, uh, attention span, we're slowing it down for them, mm-hmm. which is, like, crazy to me. Right. It it's just doesn't fair. sound right. right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I, like, I think a lot of it, too, is I think, you know, I think modernism has taken over the university system, you know, and I'm not against it. You know, you and I have talked about that, Bobby. I'm not against, you know, abstract paintings. and I'm, That's not really about that, but but you know but um but i think modernism has really taken over the university system and what has happened as a result of that is the people that end up getting teaching degrees and end up teaching in high school are don't know don't know how to do it so they're teaching what they learned in college which was you know expression first technique later and actually what's being taught now is that that the if the more you learn about technique the literally like art critics are saying that now the worse of an artist you become like, like I read some quotes, some guy was saying, everyone's de-techniquing now and, and because it's, you know, because that's the way to go. And, I, and wow. it, you know, it's like, what? You know, so I think, I think a lot of it is that, I'll, honestly, they don't have the tools. And that's where someone like Dustin is going to be awesome because, you know, obviously he's got the tools. And, and he's building teach tools, too. Yeah, yeah. And he's approaching it with the respect 
of the craft of making art, you know, and and that's going to translate. I mean, that's going to be a whole different group of students, and like, you know, they may not know that there at the school you're at, but that's like an entirely, I mean, that's a totally different approach than what's being taught. You know, I mean, like, you know, and and my story, you know, I went to an Ivy League school when I was working there in the medical center. I went to the an Ivy League school trying to get my master's of fine art. I could do it for free since I worked there. And I ended up dropping it and, and going to an atelier because I was like, it was so not what I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to learn, and it was drawing one, and we weren't drawing. We were just like talking about the like this. Someone had blown up these balloons and made it in the shape of an LED clock, and like, I mean, we're talking about stuff like that, and that's fine. You know, if somebody wants to go that route, that's fine. But but there should be an option for someone who actually wants to learn the craft of of painting. You know, um, so. I think that's trickled down to high school, and people just don't know. They don't know what to teach. They don't know. They don't have the the tools, so it's it's tough. Well, yeah, and uh, you know how many teachers out there actually go out to discover, you know, other methods, other things, and think about how they should teach their students, as opposed to okay, here is the curriculum that I'm supposed to go through this year. Right. I'm not right. going to look at anything else, you know. And after work, it's all about my how green my lawn is and you know like right. all i care about is looking through and seeing the new latest barbecue i'm gonna get <laughs> and their life is not about art it's crazy Don't be down on barbecuers bobby <laughs> i i love barbecues I'm by the way um, me yeah. too no i know exactly but I love what the you people mean. who do it more yes yeah. yes i know there's people that like you know i love and, people and... that barbecue yeah yeah <laughs> Well, what's funny, too, is, like, I'll, I'll know people that are, like, obsessed with their lawn, right? And I'm, like, I, and I say to them, I'm, like, wow, you must you must really have some cool plants in there and things like that. Like, you must be really into botany. They're, like, no, I'm not into botany. And I'm, like, oh, oh, you just, they're just, like, no, I just like taking care of my lawn. I'm, like, okay, hey, that's that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't work for me, but go for it, man, you know. <laughs> it's always funny. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. I totally, totally know what you mean. So in the grand um, search for ultimate awesome knowledge, uh, this will lead into our next question. Zuzu asks, um, John, is your way of teaching, is this the academic old way like they did in the 19th century, or is it more of an updated way? Um, it, it, it's a little bit, it, it is similar, like, um, you know, obviously, if you know, when if I'm re- referencing Zorn and Sargent and things like that, and the way that they worked, so it, you know, their late 18th century, early 19th century. I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. Wait, is that right? Late 19th century. Wait, whatever it is. <laughs> Eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> so, um, but you know, if I'm referencing them, it, it's you know that this is similar to the way that they worked. It's um, the idea of relationships that I that I talk about and the different things that I do there. Um, Really, it's kind of a mixture for me of the classical tradition and also m- me hanging out with illustrators and concept artists all the time. Because, you know, I, maybe this is the way it was back then, but we haven't, we don't have too much of a, of a record of it. Because a lot of the paintings, you know, you have like Alma Tadema, you have like Bouguereau. I mean, really, they're illustrations like a lot of times. You know, you have these mythical situations or, or you know, these gods that they're painting and these whole big compositions. And really, you know, and then you see Donato Giancola, you know, and, and you're like, well, there you go. I mean, he's he's kind of a mixture of both, too. He has sort of a classical approach, but he's, you know, he, it might be in space, you know, or it might be Lord of the Rings or whatever. But it's really, it, it, it starts to gel and become the same. But, but it is updated a little bit because, um, you know, it, we have the advantage now of having access to a ton of different things. So you have the original traditional classical approach, which is, you know, breaking things down to the lights and the darks and you know and uh you know dealing with the masses of of light and dark and then working on the edges and working with casts and things like that you know i did all that and that so that's absolutely a part of this but the idea of color relationships is is influenced by you know sort of the impressionist side of things and um you know uh there were a lot of other artists that were messing with edges and and, you know things like that so it is it's it's probably closer to the classical side but it is a little bit uh, updated and it's it's definitely influenced by my illustrator and concept artist friends who who really dig and dig to understand what's going on so that they can un, you know unpack reality and then you know repackage it with their own imaginative stuff you know 
and and I'm actually really excited about where art's going because um, one of the one of the really good galleries, Arcadia Gallery, um, they uh, recently like this was this was kind of sad. You know, they had to drop a bunch of artists because they kind of changed their focus, but they had a bunch of really classically like a lot a lot of the artists were may, they may have different subject matter, but they worked very very strictly sort of classical you know in nature mm -hmm. and now they're calling themselves arcadia contemporary and it's and i saw a lot of illustrators a lot of concept guys all of a sudden now showing up in their gallery and everything and i i think it's actually amazing because uh, and even the fact that i'm teaching on schoolism and it's resonating with people and things i, I think it's fantastic because i think i'm hoping that these classical guys will start to merge with you know the guys in the entertainment field and things like that because i oh, think of course yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, and I see that happening, you know. Like, uh, you know, I, I got um, there was a guy a long time ago that contacted me that that did the uh, environments for Gears of War, and he was asking about, you know, and and he actually sent me a whole swag package. It was it was really nice. I have to look at look at his um, name. I have to look it up because it was a long time ago, but it was the first Gears of War. But but he um he sent it. You know, he sent. He, we were going back and forth. He was asking about galleries and and things like that, and and he really really nice guy and fantastic work, you know, and so classical guys are now starting to say look at this environment for this look at how they're doing this look at how they're like like we can learn from this you know what i mean like this isn't this stuffy old you know i don't need to just look at the late 1800s and early 1900s to figure out what i you know what i can paint you know and it's starting to merge and because of that everyone's becoming stronger i think and and the information is flowing and so it's 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 really exciting i, I think it's a i think we're in a really cool time and, and knowledge can be exchanged so quick and so fast and and um, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, to get all the knowledge we can get now in the early eight, early 1900s, late 1800s, man, they had to just really give up everything in their life and just travel around and, and spend years and years and years trying to compile this knowledge and, like, just, you know, trying to get the scraps of that knowledge, like, any way they could, you know? And so um, it's it's a great time. It's it's really, it's cool. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of awesome art come out. Yeah, and just to touch on a couple of things that you are saying about uh, well, first, you know, a lot of these uh, traditional techniques and all this stuff, all these painting methods, all these painting um, palettes, and you know, they are absolutely uh, dribbling in or flooding into the concept art world. If you just look at the Marvel art books, you know, Ryan, Ryan uh, Maynardine, I hope I pronounced that right, right? Of course, he is the head of visual development at Marvel Studios. And if you follow, you should totally follow this guy on I Instagram look, if, yeah, I if you guys aren't. Yeah, Ryan underscore Minor Dean. It should, I believe it should be called Minor Dean. Um, excuse me if I mix the pronunciation. But it's Ryan underscore M-E-I-N-E-R-D-I-N-G underscore art you're gonna see the most fantastic art that looks like if it wasn't captain america and stuff like that and they put it in a museum right it would be like that that totally fits in right right totally. that's where all like if leonardo da vinci and michelangelo and all these people live now or zorn was living now as an artist i'm sure many of them would actually find their way to uh you know things like the entertainment business and stuff oh like absolutely that. they would think it was awesome like they would they would you know i know they would i mean like you know it, it would it would be like they would they would be like whoa what is this you know uh like you know because you know it, it and it everything feeds off everything you know um you know mo you know art feeds off movies movies feed off art like you know it, it's it's like and the technology then pushes new things and and technology like drives new art to happen but then the art also feeds off the you know it's it's very interesting to see how things grow and change and and you know i mean even our under, like in scott robertson's book on perspective he talks about you know the camera right mm -hmm. so he talks about okay what what type of lens are we using well you know when they first were talking about proportion way back when they didn't you know people didn't had think about that photo, yeah they had photographs but they were like well you just put it up and and take a photo you don't really have too many options you know now we're thinking about all those different things and it, and it changes it changes the way that we approach stuff so it's 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 cool it's it's cool to see it evolving and and you know things you know uh, you know people probably in the in the classical art world you know probably feel like oh man 
You know, I've, I've never, I've never felt like I'm going to become obsolete. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I've never felt like that. Uh, you know, and I actually just enjoy looking at the art that's out there. It, it, it inspires me, and it also motivates me to think differently. And and I don't really ever have the fear of you know becoming obsolete like that because it's just it all relates, you know. And it and really, it's all going to start to group up. It, it really will, big time. Well, like for me, I I do actually feel like. Uh, if I don't watch myself, I am going to become obsolete because, you know, <laughs> I'm a cog in a much bigger machine, right? right? Right. So that's a huge difference. Technology pushes art. Art pushes mm-hmm. technology or inspires technology, perhaps. Um, so, you know, and this actually comes back to something that you were saying earlier on, saying that some schools, they t- look down on you learning other people's techniques which mm-hmm. is insane, which is absolutely insane. It's like telling a coder, don't look at anybody else's code to build whatever it is you're going to program. Well, it actually goes beyond that, actually. I, like, I was literally told not only not to look at someone else's, but not to pursue it. So, like, it would be like telling wow. a coder, don't pursue proper code. <laughs> like, literally just go in and start typing. Like, that's the best way to be an artist. Like, Absolutely insane. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, like, I, like it, it's, like I said, I have no problem. So many, I, there's a lot of abstract paintings that I really like, and there, and the focus of, of the ones that I like, the, the artists that, that are making the work that I like, you know, and I, I have them all kind of stashed. To be honest, truth be told, I don't look at them very often, you know, but um, but there are some that I've found over the years that I've liked, and and, and you know, they approach it, you know, similar to the way that I would approach things. You know, it's a craft, and you can tell. Like when you look at their work, and and you can see it's it's it's. You're like, that's very difficult to do, and that's it's the design is very very nice. You know, it's not just, you know, something, you know, just slapped up. You know, or or something done. Like I remember being at a, at, and this guy kind of scoffed at me. Like I was at this university thing, and I asked him. I said, and it was an honest question because I wanted to know because he had this whole long diatribe like where he, where his the vocabulary was flying and it was like this totally like erudite like vomit i thought you know where mm. but you know he was there and i asked him this question i said well how do you decide how representational you know to be and and how you know basically mm-hmm. how intentional to be how do you decide that you know and he's like well you know basically saying he, he had spent 45 minutes talking about all of his work and how it was arranged in this space you know purposefully and all that and then he's proceeded to say how he, he doesn't try to force meaning on the viewer and things like that and he just lets it flow and I'm thinking to myself well that's why your compositions look like that because you just let it flow mm-hmm. <laughs> you know like that's why they look sophomoric you know because of that you know and but to him it doesn't matter because that's not the purpose of art you know the purpose of art is to create a discussion not to make something beautiful or you know and, and so you know it, it's it's interesting man it's really interesting you know and so uh, you know I think honestly that illustrators, concept artists, the people that are in the entertainment industry are, are leading the charge, and and I think art is going to shift that way. I think it really will, you know. And 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 I think the the people who are seeing it apart from the craft of making art are, are eventually going to, you know, be sort of pushed out naturally, you know. Yeah, and let me let me express to everybody how like why I'm so excited about your class uh, essentials of realism because it does tackle art from a uh, from the you know traditional uh, methods of the atelier but it's it's put on its head you know because it's taught in a way like you're doing digital painting right now this is taught in right. a way that supports uh, what you know, like the things that I do, like entertainment art for movies, television, games, that kind of thing, mm-hmm. and uh, you're taking techniques. It's like if we go back to the whole uh, computer code analogy. It's like you're taking solid code to make new code, right? right. And it's like that's how uh, progress happens. That's how evolution happens. So it's very exciting. You know, you can't code the iPhone or something like that with ones and zeros, just typing in ones and zeros. You know, you got to build on top of, you got to learn techniques and then build on top of techniques. Right. And and just learning one technique is not going to do you nearly as much good probably wouldn't do you any good because you'd be a rundown version of whoever it is you're studying right right but uh yeah 
learn many techniques, learn many different ways on how to do things. And that's another you know, reason why I love your course is it is so different from how I was doing things before. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, and people have asked me, well, what, you know, can I do it digitally or can I do it? Do I have to use traditional materials? And I'm like, no, use, use whatever materials you got. I can help you with traditional ones, but, you know, if you want help with that. But, but you know, it, it, and to me, like, people always ask me about that. Well, what do you think about digital? And I'm like, it's just another medium. Like, it, to me, it's like what's, it has strengths and it has weaknesses just like any medium. You know, it's like you have to behave differently when you're making a watercolor painting than you do when you're making, a, you know, an oil painting. And so you have to use different approaches and you you know and that's the fun part you know you get to try out those different approaches and digital really it's just a different medium and there there really are strengths and weaknesses to it and and you know of course the major strength with it is time you know what i mean like the the and no drying times layers undo you know mm-hmm. <laughs> you know all i mean those things are a strength but those those things can also be a weakness as well it can foster certain behaviors and 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 certain things like that just like if you're working in watercolor you're going to build it up slowly, right? You're not going to do too many strokes. It depends on how you. It depends on how you approach it, of course. But, but a lot of times when people are working in watercolor, it, it feeds sort of a, a mentality where they don't like to take risks, you know. Um, and then you have some people that take extreme risks with watercolor, you know. But, um, but you know, so there, there's always things to consider when it comes to every every medium. And and the 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 thing that I always talk about, and and I think the thing that's resonating for the students in my class is the fact that the fundamentals don't change, you know. And what you see me doing here. You know, like approaching it based on these lights and darks and kind of dealing with the shapes of lights and darks. You know, you'll see, I mean, if you go and look at like, um, you know, Craig Mullins, you go and look at Justin Sweet, you know, you look at those guys, they're doing this, you know, Mm -hmm. they're doing this stuff. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a Minotaur. Yeah. It's a, you know, whatever, a tank or whatever, but they're, they're doing this and they understand the structure underneath what they're painting, but then they're flip flopping between this approach and that approach. You know, they're, they're doing both. You know, and 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 that's what makes their work so dynamic and makes it so interesting. And and they have kind of the same thing with their work, Advanced Kovacs too. You know, where they where you look at it and you're like, it looks like nothing's there, but yet it all makes sense and everything. And that's that's exactly what I'm doing here. And and so, you know, if you can combine both approaches and you can, you know, you can you can just get some really amazing dynamic results. It's it's awesome. It's really really cool. And you can see I'm not you know. I'm working on one layer here. I don't have multiple layers when I'm doing this, and, and I'm color picking. Like I, I, I color pick from the image sometimes, but a lot of times I'll go and, and pick over here because that simulates kind of how I, uh, how I just naturally work with a palette, you know, from, uh, in, you know, in, in real life, you know. And um, uh, this actually segues into uh, a question that was asked by Confuse Art. Uh, this person says, why should I stop using the color picker tool? Um, so, you know, sometimes it is appropriate to use the color picking tool, right, John? But sometimes, um, if you're always using color picker tool, you will generally, uh, start to get less and less saturated colors, Mm -hmm. Uh, especially if your color picker tool is set to not picking by the pixel, but by picking the average within a three by three picks, you know, pixels mm-hmm. or nine by nine, even, even worse. Uh, so that's why generally, you know, you want to get into the habit of mixing your own colors and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same, like what, you know, it's the same with me when I'm working, um, you know, with a palette and working with oil paints, you know, if you, you can make a pool of color, right? So I can mix up a whole big fat pool of color and then pull from that for the entire painting and just kind of shift it and tint it one way or the other. But you know what happens when I do that is everything looks bland and, and dull by the end. And that's exactly the way it'll be when you're just color picking. You know, if you never grab a new color and just inject something in there and try to get what it is, you know, um, it, it's, you'll, you'll lose something. And also there's, there's a real strength to sort of having a little bit more broken color and you can see, like, seeing that, like, uh, that uh, right side of the bed, you know, I'm looking for those colors that I'm seeing there when I'm looking at that, and I'm, I'm you know, kind of unashamedly putting them in right there. Now, the edges and the, and the values will change a little bit and stuff like that, but I, I'm just going for it with the colors that I'm seeing there. I'm not pulling from anything else in the image. I'm just trying to react to what I'm, what I'm seeing there. Mm-hmm. And so that makes a difference. Like, it, it, by the end, you know, it, it, it looks much more dynamic. It looks much more natural and... 
and actually looks the color looks a lot more interesting. It, it really can look dull if you if you uh, you know tr- you know just uh, just pull from what you've got. It'll look like this brown mess, or it'll look you know whatever. Right on, and um, you know time always goes by so quick. We're already past the hour point. Let's try to finish up these questions here. So sure. Next question is from Justin. Uh, or sorry, from Marks Everywhere. He says, uh, hey guys, what do you do when a client likes your work uh, but you really don't feel like you like it or you know it's working or vice versa? A client hates your work but you think it's awesome. <laughs> 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 well, uh, the first one, you know, if the client likes it at that time, then I generally... Unless it Cash looks like, check. yeah, as <laughs> well, that's, and that, you know, that's why you want to really uh, be sure that you like the work before you hand it in. So you won't have this issue. Yeah. The other version where the client doesn't like it, but you like it. Well, y- you know, you're working for the client. So uh, your goal should be to create their whatever their task their vision whatever it is um in a way where it pleases you and the client so and that's my goal anyways um any thoughts about this yeah i mean you know for me i have commissions and things like that so i have to deal with the same type of thing yeah that's even more because you're probably painting portraits as well sometimes and then you know it's like oh that doesn't look like me (laughs) oh yeah dude that's and people do not know what they look like like as and and like i i I, you know early on in my career i was kind of like now i'm confident enough to be like no i nailed this like (laughs) you need to get over it you know so there's there's times like you know there's time like but you really you know that's when you you it depends it depends on how successful you are you know really how much you can sort of demand like when i first started i would i I probably would acquiesce a little bit more than i would now to what someone would say now but it's different because i feel like with a commission like when i'm doing a portrait it's someone who's hiring me to get my vision you know like like they saw my other body of work and now they want me to do to paint them in that style you know mm-hmm. in what i do you know whereas with with you bobby it's a little bit different there because they're like their end result is not for not necessarily like based on the previous things that you've done and like oh we want it to look exactly like this it's more you know we have this end result and, and this end goal and you are very good at achieving those goals and, and so it is different that way i think and i think you know for you you know you, you in that situation it, it's you uh, you know i would i would you know uh kind of bend a little bit more than i probably do now to to the client uh, way more you know I would yeah like, for sure and well that's because yeah. you know it's like um if you were painting a part of a painting and it, you know it's this giant painting and everybody involved you highly respect and then the client the person that has the vision of this super giant crazy painting done by you know a hundred painters tells you that he doesn't or she doesn't like what you're doing then you're going to be much more inclined to change it right right, right. because you respect the team you respect the vision Absol- you know Absol- yeah and and you know that i mean and and the truth is too like i mean when you're doing concept order when you're doing anything like that i mean stuff's going to change like it's just going to change and and not and one of the things i've learned is the more like I, I, I'll make a piece of art. Like I'll make a painting, and it's like a different direction for me or something. And then I get a whole bunch of people saying they like it, and a whole bunch of people that say they don't like it. The more, the more I start to like kind of push in a different direction, the more divisive my art becomes. I've found. Um, and so you know, you kind of at a certain point, you know, you can't, you don't, you, you learn not to take it personally. Like you, you, I've had people totally trash my work, and it's actually been really helpful because they've trashed my work, and and they've been right you know and that's actually helped me so um helped me you know do better and and see things that i didn't see and they were being rude about it but it still helped it was free advice for me and it actually ended up helping you know but (laughs) but um but you know you can't take it personal and so when that happens you know especially in that situation where a client's like hey we need this it's never something personal you know it's not like you know and, and we tend to as artists we tend to take it that way like oh man you know that i i'm not i'm not measuring up or whatever but I mean, you can, I'm sure you can speak to this highly, Bobby, that it is going to change. Like, how many things 
have you submitted that they said this is perfect you you know only yeah, once, I mean... only <laughs> once have they ever been like, you know, I hand in the very first painting. They're like, okay, awesome. Now do this one. You were like, what? Yeah, like... I was like, <laughs> I, I, you know, once in the last, what, over 10 years. Wow. So that's, yeah, that's pretty. Uh... And you know what? The no funny chump. thing was, you're I was no chump, like, man. I was like thinking to myself, no, that's not right. You know, it's not there yet because you guys haven't told me to fix all these things. So I felt completely paranoid about my idea. Um, let's go on to the next question here. Uh, oh, by the way, I want to mention to everybody, uh, you know, I've been mentioning your class and how much I love it and all this stuff. And Miss has been in it. She's been loving it as well um the next session of your class of essentials of realism with john hardesty is starting may 2nd 2016 so a yep. few months get on it it will change your life i'm telling you it will change your perspective it will heighten your art and it will expand your mind um no joke okay let's go on to the next question this one's from justin justin says this is for you, Bobby. What motivates you to do these awesome streams? What keeps you motivated? Well, shoot. <laughs> you know what? It's all of you guys. It's all of you guys always, you know, encouraging me. And when I stop doing the streams, uh, you know, I, I think I stopped for a good, like, two years or something like that. It felt like something like that. I would just still get emails every single day <laughs> every single day for two years at least one email telling me how how much you guys miss the streams and things like that and uh you know uh in the beginning and i would love to know if this is kind of similar to you john and why teaching and all this stuff has been become so um important for you in the beginning it was all about myself. It was all about Bobby. <laughs> Whatever will help Bobby out the most, you know, because you're trying to survive. You're eating right. ramen every day right. and you right. don't want to eat freaking ramen no more. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so that's how a lot of things usually begin. Then things start taking off. Things start doing better. And then what does it become? It becomes all about... Um, still became all about me it became like how do i get rid of some of these responsibilities how do i you know <laughs> so i could paint more or whatever it is i might want to do travel and stuff so then it became about you know hiring people to support me and then it becomes all about the team you know how do i get the team to excel and it's all about the team what's great for the team what's great for the company and then after that when that solidifies and you got your stuff going you got your you know uh legions of uh collectors going and everything then it becomes all about society i think i think this is the right. natural progression where it becomes about how do i make a mark in this world that will leave the world in a better place than when i started and so that's what heavily motivates me nowadays is just I don't want to leave this planet thinking that I left it in more of a mess than I, uh, you know, came into it as. I already feel like that a bit with all the garbage and things like that that, you know, I end up accumulating just from sure. buying things. And... <laughs> Anyways, that's why. That's why. That's what motivates me. It's all you guys out there and the feeling like I'm, I'm doing something positive for the world. Absolutely, man. Right. You know, it's, yeah, it's, and, and really, you know, the truth, the truth is like, you know, I had a friend who, you know, was really depressed and she, she was having a hard time, you know, and, and, and it was justified, you know, she had a rough situation, but I told her, I said, you know what you need to do? She said, what? I said, you need to get out and do something for somebody else. Cause she was starting to get a little bit of self-focus and, and like poor me and that type of a thing, which, which a lot of it was deserved. But I told her, I said, look, you gotta get out there. I said, you gotta, you gotta start helping someone else. I said, it changes your perspective. It you know, um, it, 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 we, it, humanity feels the best, you know, when you're, when they're helping e each other, you know, absolutely 100%. Like we feel like, you know, and even as kids, you know, 
you, if you see kids in the grocery store and the kids like the the parents like I'll give you whatever you want whatever whatever you want just tell me the kids always like I hate you you know what I mean like <laughs> and the kids that that are disciplined appropriately you know mm. and, and they're the ones who are have respect for themselves respect for their parents they're happier you know and 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 you know it, it, it's it's interesting. Like we we think that we want to get a bunch of stuff for ourselves, and that's going to make us really really happy, and it just never does. You know. No. And you get that stuff, and you're like, okay, and that becomes old, and then and then eventually you realize, you know what? I think I'm going to pour into other people because uh, that's that's going to really be good. You know, and that's what I want to do. You know, and and uh, so you know that's why I had that's why I have kids. That's why. You know, I have kids. Really, people ask me, well, what, what, what should you say to somebody that's having kids? I say, don't have kids to get something from them. Have kids to give. That's it. If you have kids to give and you have that mentality, then it will change your entire parenting, you know. And, and, and you, you don't, if you don't expect anything from them ever, you know, and you're only there to, to serve, it's, 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 you know, it's going to change the way you function. And, it's and pretty so, much the worst investment you ever made, <laughs> if that's right, what you're thinking. <laughs> right, right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. A hundred percent. A hundred percent, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I mean, my daughter, she's four years old. She just, she needs to get $3,000 of work on her teeth done. Oh, and I'm like, geez. I don't have the money for that. I just found that out, you know, and it's like, but I, I love her. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I wouldn't trade it. And people, it's weird. It's weird to hear someone say that, but, you know, but of course I, you know, and it's, and, and she's making me a better person just by virtue of who she is, you know, and, and, you know, so it's, it's interesting. So, you know, don't forget that because as you grow, like you're going to have a ton of people helping you. There are things like this. Bobby's doing this, you know, and people are giving of their time. People are helping you. And don't forget that when you become an artist and, and there's a lot of other kids that you'll find that are struggling, that feel down, that, that are working day in and day out and they can't, can't get it done. And, and, you know, don't have the time to do it or, or it's tough. You know, they're staying up late eating ramen. Like, I ate, I ate lentils for three weeks when I was training, and my wife and I, I now I can eat them, but for a while I couldn't. You oh, had yours. Man. What was yours, Bobby? You uh, said it once. Cocoa Pebbles, man. Cocoa I, pebbles. To this day, I cannot eat Cocoa Pebbles because, That's a bad one to eat yeah, for, three, for a whole three. week, for a whole week, like breakfast, <laughs> lunch, dinner, and I had to ration them. That's how sad it was because I, a box couldn't hold me for a whole week. And then I ran out of milk in the la- in the first like two three days. So sad in your room, crutching. sad, lethar- lethargic, no energy. It was brutal. Yeah, I mean that's you know that that happens. So people will be going through that. They'll be going through the same thing that maybe some of you are going through. Maybe you're not, but but don't forget that. You know, don't forget that, and don't forget the help that you got. And and you know, it's kind of a smack in the face to the people that helped you for you to treat other people poorly later on. You know, and so. Um, you know, so yeah, so I mean, I, I, I got so much help, so many things I can't even remember all of them. You know, people in, like encouraging me or helping me, and when my work was horrible, when it didn't deserve the attention they gave it. You know, so just remember that. Totally. Um, the next question is, how, how important is it to build an, I, sorry, how to build a personal uh, painting style? for an artist how, how important is it to build your own personal painting style as an artist i had to kind of reshape the, the question a bit but um it, you know for me it's yeah of course that's crazy super important uh, but the flip side to that is i i highly uh i highly believe that the best styles are the ones that aren't um forcibly developed you know it's a natural thing through learning through experiences and just through constant constant learning absolutely yeah i agree 100 percent. like and 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 i say don't fight your your inclination you know like don't absolutely. fight your you know don't fight your strengths like i have people that are super detail oriented that study with me and they're like anal retentive you know and then they're like i really want to do loose paintings and i'm like not so sure that that's what you should do you know and 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 I'm like, it could be that that you that you end up doing that. I'm like, but they, but they everything they turn into me is like this tight painting, and, and but that somehow somewhere along the way, someone told them that painting tight is wrong or something, you know. And and you know, I, I like Bouguereau just as much as I like Sargent, and and you know, it's just different. So, you know, 
don't worry about, I would say, don't worry about um, let, let, totally what you said, Bobby. Let it come naturally and let it be an extension of who you are, you know, and what you like. And that will evolve and change, and, and that's good. Um, and, and let it come naturally, but just focus on being good. Don't The rest will come out sort of naturally, I feel like. You know, um, uh, you know when people have the, that sort of God complex with an artist and they try to try to match every tiny little thing that that, that artist does, it, it always just ends up looking like a bad version of that person, you know? Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where just, just focus on being good and, and let it, let your art sort of lead you, you know, uh, as you move along. That's what William Whitaker told me is good advice because it absolutely will. Totally. Yeah, totally. Totally. All right. Next question is, um, Chemi asks, "What's happening in the foreground? Is that another dog?" But no, it's not. It's a doggy bed, right? Yes. Right on. Okay. Oh wait, she's got. She, I see it over here. She said, "Oh, it's his bed." She's got it. She's. Got oh, okay, it. okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tiffany asks, "How do you get art jobs or a following or both?" Uh, you know, nowadays it seems like you need one to get the other, almost mm-hmm. right. Like uh, there's. Yeah. A lot of times, like, for example, some studios, you look in their studio and every one of those artists, you're like, oh, yeah, I follow that person on Instagram. Oh, I, I seen that person's stuff on Twitter and this and that. And it's almost like these some studios, if they have enough bankroll, are practically collecting um artists that they like with big followings and stuff like uh expensive baseball cards. Yeah. But... um <laughs> You know, generally, you have a big following, so you could get jobs easier, or you get a lot of awesome jobs, and so you collect a big following. How do you do things if you don't have either? Uh, just a couple very general rules. Stay consistent with your posts. You know, as much as you can, stay absolutely consistent. Um, you want to become the best thing is that you become somebody's habit. You know, like uh, when Inktober was happening, I would go to Twitter and I'm following like probably over a thousand people. I don't know how or why. And I would intentionally search up Peter DeSev because I wanted to see what Peter DeSev's Inktober drawing was of that Mm -hmm. day, right? Because he was doing it every day. And so he became part of my habit. I'm sure he became a lot of people's habits of just Mm -hmm. checking his Inktober stuff. And same thing with, you know, uh, web comics. I have a a wonderful friend, Lard D'Souza. He is a full-time web comic artist. And he says all his stuff is posted, like, down to the second, absolutely the same every day. Mm. You know, and, and he talks about how important consistency is in posting and stuff if you want to gain a big following um some people actually don't want to gain a big following like some fine artists you could see them like they're huge in the fine art industry but hey they only have like a thousand followers or something that in the grand scheme of things isn't that much i thought that that was very interesting and then some fine artists are complete social media you know whores (laughs) whores <laughs> and uh are just nothing but right and and it's awesome i love following those people too because they're so consistent uh but you know what i mean and i'm sure john you probably have a lot more uh feedback on this than i would well yeah i mean you know it's it's i think consistency is the big thing you know and and, and also just being yourself like be yourself like don't you know and and people are always like, I, I gotta have an angle, and I gotta have you know this, and that all that stuff happens naturally, you know, all that stuff happens naturally, you know, it's it's just be yourself. What are you doing? You know what I mean? And like, and people feel like I need better equipment or I need you know better this, and and, and no, just what 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 are you doing? You know, like are you exercising? All right, and you want to have people follow along when you're exercising? All right, well, just what do you have? Okay, I got a camera phone. Well, just use that. Or just you know whatever like and then as you grow you can build that up but it's it's more about if you want to build a following it's more about the consistency like like you said Bobby it's huge people need to know that you're there that you're going to be you know what type of things you're going to be doing and then and then you know I mean 
to be totally frank and honest, when I when I like look on YouTube and I see that the the primary person that has the most you know the subscribers is PewDiePie, I'm like, okay, like you know, <laughs> I watched some of the videos and it could just be a couple of videos that I saw, but I was like, wow, this does not appeal to me at all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some of it's funny, some of it's funny. I've seen some that are pretty funny, but. But, you know, but it, I mean, he's super consistent for who knows how many years, who knows, and, and no one ever talks about that, but, you know, I know they were kind of mocking him on, um, it was like Jimmy Kimmel or something like that, but, dude, that guy has probably put in immense amounts of work. Oh, and, yeah. I mean, immense amounts of work, and so, I mean, like, and been totally consistent over the years of doing that. There's no other way to get to like that uh, unless you do that, and, and um, you know, uh, and, and, then once you have that, you got to protect it. You know, you got you got to stick with it and stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to get better with mine too. Like I, I you know, I'm up, I'm over a thousand now. I'm like, I don't know what I'm at. I'm over a thousand, which is actually good for me because I just started, you know, doing it consistently recently. You know, and um, and so it's going good. But I'm just going to keep up with it too. And and I like the community on there. I like it. It goes both ways, you know. But um, but uh, but yeah, I know there's some fine artists that that just they swear off everything, you know, and and. They do fine because the galleries do it for them. That, I think that's why. Well, yeah, and you know, it's interesting. I was, uh, I was talking about, I was talking with a fine artist, and this person was saying that, um, that the that he tweeted out about his gallery show happening, mm-hmm. right? And then all these fans started coming in and started checking out the paintings and everything. And then the gallery was like, "Hey, hey, stop doing that." You're attracting the wrong people, and it's hard for us to sell these expensive paintings because our gallery is flooded with fanboys, fangirls. <laughs> really interesting. Really that interesting. That is very interesting. Yep. Yep. Um, let's go on to another. And by the way, for all of you that are not following uh, John Hardesty on Instagram, you can follow him at uh, John, that's J O N, and then hard as in soft and hard. S D E S T Y. Treat it all as one word, and you'll you'll find them and uh, see all sorts of awesome stuff. And uh, Masay, why don't we? You know, I would love to hear because it's so great having you here because like you are on your way, you know, and <laughs> so you can remember how it was, and you yeah. are in the middle of it. So you've also kind of just really started getting into your Instagram. Yeah, after talking every time you were mentioning how I ha- like people have to be consistent in order to kind of gain the following and yeah, after that I've been trying to post more artwork every single day. Right on. And uh I want to give a big plug out to your Instagram. Oh, it's just my name, Masei Seki. Okay, so for those of you that don't know how to spell Masei Seki, it's <laughs> M A S A E S E K I, and we'll put it in the video as well. And so, last couple thoughts about like jobs, because we want to touch on that as well, not just the following. Um, jobs, I, I find a big part of it is the setup, which is, you know, just starting to talk to them. And then you got to follow it up with the meetup. Where are they going to be? Where are these people going all the time? That's why it's so important to go to functions, workshops, conventions, whatever it is, award shows, things like that, uh, where all these people are so you can have the face-to-face, talk with them in person. They could see if they want to work with you or not. Hopefully they do, and then you get jobs. You know, that is one of the best ways. And communicate with other people don't just be a poster you know comment on other people's stuff start creating relationships this is something that i did from the start just naturally because you know i'm just a huge fan of of art and uh you know admirer of so many different artists so i will even if i'm nervous i'll go up and i'll talk with them and you know meet them and in hindsight, that was one of the biggest things that helped me because, you know, so many of your jobs that you get are from uh, referrals, you know, uh, past employers that tell some new employer, things like that. So, 
communicate. You know, you could do that online as well. Just comment on people's stuff and don't just say, cool, even though that's probably what I put on your stuff, John. I don't even know, or Masay <laughs> stuff, because I just, I don't have the time to write a whole sentence out. Um, I, I like, a, if I get a cool from Bobby, Bobby Chu, I'm good, man. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, like, if, if uh, you can put thoughtful comments on people's stuff mm -hmm. and don't just put stuff like, hey, nice job, check out my page. Oh, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, no, those. Think those of it know. as like, think of it as uh, talking with anybody. Yeah, just be genuine. Yeah. If you like somebody, you know, you're not going to say, hey, how's it going? My name is so and so. You want to come over to my house? <laughs> you know, okay. like, that's not going to work. Anyways, you're coming uh, on too strong. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, let's go on to the next question here. So the next question is, and we just got three more. Okay, we're just going to do these last three, and we're going to cut it then. Uh, so Justin asks John or Bobby, if this were being uh, painted in oil medium, how different would the technique be from what you do digitally? I'm going to let John handle this. Oh, it actually would be really similar. Like. I kind of, uh, I, uh, you know, I kind of, um, I mean, I wouldn't have the undo button, you know, <laughs> but it would be really similar. Like whenever you see me grabbing from the color palette, you know, up there, you know, uh, that's what I, I would just be going and mixing that, um, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, it, it's pretty similar to how I would work. Uh, with with a quick study like this, you know, if I have a more involved composition or whatever, of course I do composition studies, and I would do that. And then if I needed to make sure that a certain effect was achieved or whatever, I would do studies of that and try to get all that worked out beforehand. But really, doing a quick study or something, it would it would function the same way. Um, you know, I kind of that I feel like this is kind of the way of paint. I kind of can't. It's it would be hard for me to to deviate from it. I could. I've seen some guys when they're working digitally, like like sort of work with uh, silhouettes of different things and. And they like put a dark silhouette down, and then they'll put some gradients over top of it. And I saw some guys at Massive Black doing that. And then they would work it up based on the gradient, you know, so like the gradient would follow where the light's falling and stuff. I could probably do that if I wanted to, but it would be a little bit more tricky for me. Like it would, I would, it would take some, it would take some, some getting used to or whatever to to do that. But it would be very, very similar to this. You know, you'd just see a little bit more paint on my hands and. <laughs> from all the mixing or whatever, you know, but it'd be very, very similar to this approach. And another uh, painting question, this one's from Toby Art for you. Uh, do you just keep the brush consistently at 100% flow and opacity, or are you using a multiply or anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, um, I probably keep the opacity fairly high. Like, um, usually 80 to 90 is where it kind of sits most of the time. 100% if I really need to cut into a shape and, like, change the drawing, you know, and quite a your, bit. And then your flow? Yeah, and the flow is usually, like, um, I, I vacillate there between, like, I usually don't have it down below, like, 40. You know, usually it's, like, 60 to, to 80 or something. So it is very, like, sort of opaque. And the reason I, I do that is because it, I guess because it just feels more like paint to me. Like, I do alter the the opacity if I have a soft edge, though. So, like, to me it's funny because, I you know, after painting with oils for so long I kind of look at the Photoshop tools this, the way I would look at, at something else so like what, the opacity to me is like me adding medium like a adding a, like my solvent and my you know I usually have a little bit of right now I'm using um, uh, uh, Neo Megelp with uh, cut with solvent so it's got an oil and, and then a solvent in it. and so the more solvent I add the thinner the paint the more it spreads out the more it flattens and ultimately the more you know, transparent it is. And so, uh, to me, like when I lower the opacity, it's like me adding more medium to the, the paint mix. And so when I want to get a real soft edge and, and a really nice kind of very soft transition, I'll lower the opacity then. And, and then, um, when I want it to be, yeah, you guys can't, I guess you guys can't see that on this, but I'm, I'm usually keeping it around 80% opacity and, and then the flow where that is. And then, then lowering like to like, 20% or something like that and using a light touch to get those soft edges and then going immediately back up to the more opaque uh, way of laying down strokes. One of the, one of the things I, I don't like to see in digital is sort of the fuzzy, like ultra transparent thing. And it's just a personal preference, you know, for me too, but I don't like seeing that fuzziness and, and that uh, now, like I say, that transparent 
you know, kind of round brush thing. But then I see Craig Mullins doing it in his paintings, and I'm like, that's sick, good, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so, you know, where it's it, like, so like lifelike. And then you, you start yeah. to look at the edges of the painting. You're like, man, that is just a default brush. <laughs> it's so awesome. It's He's got so awesome. nothing on it. No opacity, you know, uh, sensitivity yeah. or, you know, shape dynamics or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, incredible. it's, it's sick, man. And then a lot of times he did it with the mouse, you know? Yes. And, yes. Oh he, gosh. he, he. <laughs> what he told me was before 2005, he was still using a mouse. Oh, I believe it, man. I believe it. That's hilarious. That's, That's awesome. <laughs> so cool. It's all well, about what's going on in your head, you know? It's all about what's going on in your head. You can use a mop, and I can use a mop. I, can, I tell people, don't, don't focus on the tools. They had worse tools in the 1900s and the 1800s than, than we have now, so don't worry about the tools, you know? And it's totally, that's the key, you know? Beyond this never-ending search to figure out what different awesome artists have going on in their heads so that you can start mm-hmm. to think in those ways and learn those techniques and build on top of it and build your own thing um, and one last mention a great way to do that is through schoolism classes highly recommended because if you take a class like with John uh, his uh, essentials of realism class May 2nd he actually spends the time to paint on top of your stuff, explaining your, you know, from your own paintings, which is pretty much like the Mario uh, Brothers, you know, shortcut pipe to level eight for <laughs> those of you. Dude, that, that was an awesome reference. That played, was awesome. <laughs> yeah, the, the old school versions. Um, but that is what it is, because that's the hardest thing about art. Like, when you see John painting in the beginning, like how I was seeing it, I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what he's thinking. And then there's a point where you're like, okay, he's not blind. He is totally concentrating on these awesome things that I didn't know. I did not know. And now it's a freaking dog. Like, where did that come from? You know, that's when you start thinking like that that's because you're missing that middle piece of what is going on in john's mind right um so huge plug for your class but that's just because i am such an advocate of you and your art and your thinking and your techniques it's wonderful um i want to mention oh yeah absolutely uh well deserved i want to mention a couple or a bunch of workshops because we are planning to cover the world with like with great art knowledge um schoolism workshops coming up we have uh stockholm after that may i believe 28 29 steven silver daniel Ariga, she and kim for the first time from disney what crazy That's and then, awesome. uh chris pern sam nielsen and eric canetti for the first time from riot you know league of legends and then we're not stopping there. You know, we're going to Seattle, April 7th and 8th. Marcelo Vignali, Dice Tsutsumi, Robert Kondo, Terrell Whitlatch, Mike Yamada, and some guy named Bobby Chu. <laughs> and uh, then we have London and Berlin. Berlin's already sold out. London is almost sold out, just like I was saying. London is April 16th and 17th. Berlin is April 23rd, 24th. Sam Nielsen, Nathan Falks. Carla Ortiz, Wesley Burt, Jeff Turley, and Christoph Lotret. Crazy. And awesome. just announced yesterday, Calgary. Oh, man. Calgary Expo. Check out this lineup. Craig Mullins, who we were just talking about. Ryan Lang, who has worked in feature uh, animated and live action. Uh, Justin Fields, creature designer, Victoria Ying for the first time, Tom Flurity for the first time, and the absolute you know, queen of creature design, Terrell Whitlatch. And that's happening May 2nd and 3rd, Calgary, lining up with the Calgary Expo. So come for both. It's going to be amazing. And of course, uh, the most popular thing that everybody's on schoolism subscriptions i cannot uh promote or uh you know say enough about this because literally we are taking the best knowledge from the best people i can find all the artists that i want to learn from putting it on schoolism and having it 
as a subscription uh, platform where you're only paying you pay for the whole entire year a hundred forty four dollars and if you break it down month by month that is literally twelve dollars a month which is literally for many people out there maybe a cheap lunch that's right right compared to getting a loan to go to school with a bunch of teachers that you might not even know um so highly recommend that uh first and foremost and uh thank you Masse, for hanging out with me thank you to the audience for hanging out with me and the biggest thanks of course goes to my buddy john hardesty thank you so much for your time for your efforts and for your wonderful knowledge it's been amazing awesome thanks you too man it's great i love it awesome well uh have a great day everybody and we'll see you guys next time Hi, my name is Jonathan Hardesty and I've been a fine artist for 13 years. In my class, Essentials of Realism, we're going to explore what makes a work of art look realistic. As a representational painter, I've had to think about realism a lot over the years. And realism breaks down to four key concepts, proportion, value, edge, and color. In my class, we're going to learn how to understand those concepts, observe them properly from reality, and also be able to manipulate them while maintaining realism. All lectures are pre-recorded, so it doesn't matter what time zone you're in or what your sleeping habits are. You can access all the content when it's convenient for you. There's also no specific medium requirement for this class. Students can learn just as effectively painting and drawing digitally. Throughout the length of this class, I'll be available to answer your questions, help you with any problems, and give you one-on-one -on -one personalized instruction. In each stage, I'll be painting directly over top of your work and helping you grasp these concepts and make them your own. I have a real passion for teaching, so I'm looking forward to seeing you in my class. Sign up right away because there's only a limited amount of spaces. I'll see you there.